It has been hundreds of years since Mendel did his genetic studies using pea plants. And since then, our understanding of genetics has advanced a lot. In addition to the advanced genetics topics that we discussed in the genetics videos, we also now understand that genes are stored within chromosomes and that they will affect a lot of things in human inheritance. And we actually understand a little bit better about how genes are passed on, why some genes are linked and others are not, sex linkage, pedigrees, blood types, and a lot of other things that affect human inheritance. And so let's talk about that in this video review series. But basically, remember that chromosomes are called up chromatin, which is the way the DNA actually looks like when it's active during the interphase cycle of the cell. But as the cell starts getting ready to, to actually replicate, it calls itself up and to form chromosomes. And chromosomes forms as the double helix coils around histones, which are basically proteins, which then get together to form a scaffold, uh, which is now called nucleosomes. And then nucleosomes coil on top of each other to form coils, which form super coils when they call up, and which forms the actual chromatin or chromosome fibers. And in that way, the DNA gets packaged more and more to make it easier for chromosomes to actually transport during the cell development vision process. The basic shape of a chromosome includes the centromere, which is the point that connects two identical copies, which are called cytochromatids, and you also have a short and a longer arm, which are called P and Q arm, respectively, P for petite arm. These chromosomes are gathered together in what we call a karyotype. The human karyotype includes 23 pairs of chromosomes, 22 are called autosomes, and the last pair is called the sex chromosomes, which help determine the gender of the organism. If you have a Y chromosome, you're going to be male. If you have two paired X chromosomes, you're going to be female. And these chromosomes are also, are also organized into families. Okay, But remember, we have 23 pairs. One copy we get from mom, one copy we get from dad. And that leads us to the chromosomal theory of inheritance. But before we can talk about that, remember that everything we talk about in terms of genetics goes back to the idea of meiosis. Remember that law of segregation has everything to do with the independent assortment of chromosomes that happens during the end of phase one of the meiosis cycle. And that this also explains the law of segregation or why the genes are separating when, they, when we put them in different areas of the Punnett bon square. We're doing that to represent the separation that's actually happening during meiosis where each of the daughter cells of meiosis one receives one of the homolog pairs. And remember that since we have 23 pairs, chances are you're never going to get an exact the same combination twice or at least very rarely so because these genes are going to be independently assorted since they are each chromosome is sent one way or the other and it's always a 50-50 chance for every chromosome and what happens to one chromosome does not affect the other and that's why the traits will independently assort. That's at least what Mendel used to think. But now we also understand that that's not quite like that. And Mendel used to think that the traits were completely independent from each other. In other words, that the way that the color of the pea plant and the shape of the, of the pea plant or the P itself would not be affected by the other trait. In other words, what happens to one trait does not determine what happens to the other trait. And that goes back to the idea of independent assortment, which is tied to the separation of homologs in a random way doing meiosis. Except that Mendel was kind of wrong. Because remember that Thomas Hunt Morgan studied the Drosophila melongaster, fruit flies, to actually notice that because traits were in the same chromosome, some of them, Remember, each chromosome has thousands of genes inside of it, which means for some cases, two traits may be found inside the same chromosome. And since it's the chromosomes that independently assort, if one chromosome goes one way, the other one will go a different way. But the genes within the same chromosome will travel together during the meiosis process. And that means there's going to be linkage. And basically look at this by looking at the wild types and the mutant types of of traits. Remember, wild types is the original type, and mutant types are the change types. He discovered this pattern of linkage of genes in the same chromosome by looking at this particular crop. He looked at a fly which was wild type for body color and wings and crossed that with a mutant for both traits as well. In other words, black body and vestigial wings, which made the flies kind of fly funny because they couldn't really fly away. And as any bee cross does, you're going to get a heterozygous form out of that. So they get that heterozygous and crosses again again with the double mutant that you did in the first time. Now you're not really doing uh, F1 cross 
you're actually doing a test cross because you're getting someone who's pure, heterozygous for traits and crossing with someone who's pure for traits. And in this test cross, you would expect to find a 50-50 ratio, right? If there truly is independent assortment, you should have 50% ratios for every single trait, which means 25% should have dominance for one, recessive for the other. 25% should be recessive for one, dominant for the other. 25% should be recessive for both. 25% should be dominant for both. And that is what you expect if you actually do the Punnett square for that particular cross. So in other words, what you see in option A there on the bottom should be the ratio of the distribution of this. But if the genes are linked in that way, in other words, the body color and the fly actual wing pattern is actually in the same chromosome that means that whatever one shows up the other one will show up as well and that means you're not going to get flies which look different from the parents because the genes are linked you know in other words the only way you can possibly get is the parental look or the parental type which is in this case the, the type that you see in the parents of this test cross and so you should see the wild type or the doubled mutant type. But you should not see any of the recombination types where you get a piece of mom and cross with a piece of dad or, or vice versa. But ironically, he did not find the linkage that he was expecting because of the chromosomes. He found some linkage. Check it out. Most types were actually parental. 965 were wild type for both traits. 944 were Newton type for both traits. So you get a lot of parental types. But you get a few of recombinant types. 206 gray vestigial, 185 black and normal. And these recombinant or non-parental type offspring raise the question in his brain. Now it looks like there's some linkage happening there because the majority of flies of the cross are coming out parental-like. In other words, the genes are in the same chromosome and so they, the traits are traveling together. Kind of like red color of the hair travels together with freckles in a lot of people. So these traits are linked or like black skin and dark color eyes. But sometimes you get a person who has red hair without necessarily having the freckles or sometimes you have people who are black with wing color eyes. And those are what we call the recombinant types. Types which don't actually look the way the parents of this test cross actually look like. What's happening there? Why is the linkage being broken? Well, we understand from our understanding of meiosis that it's actually crossing over that's breaking that linkage. The, the genes are crossing over between the homologue pairs of the parental type the, of the mother and because of that you were going to end up with recombinant chromosomes which then independently assort and because of those recombinant chromosomes are going to exist you're going to have recombinant types actually showing up once you actually combine them with the sperm of the male which was just the double mutant recessive look and so understanding then that the root of meiosis explains everything that happens with the genes. Sometimes independent assortment is not existing as Mendel predicted because genes are going to be in the same chromosome. But sometimes that linkage is broken because the genes are going to be crossing over during prophase 1 of meiosis. If you want to actually calculate how often those recombinants show up, it's actually very easy. You do the same thing we just did and you get the total number of recombinants or the people who didn't actually turn out the way the parents would look like and divide it by the total number of offspring and you get what it's called the recombination frequency. What that frequency will tell you then is how often crossing over is actually happening together between the traits. The greater this number is, the more often the traits are actually crossing over together. Now, now you can use that information to actually create a map of the chromosome because the thing is that it's actually going to be more unlikely for genes which are close apart in the chromosome to cross over together because if that happens it's going to increase the chances of mistakes like translocations and, and duplications to happen during the actual copy process of the actual uh, the cell division process and so to avoid that from happening if I crossed over another gene that's really far away from me is going to have to cross over to avoid problems like that which means recombination frequencies will be higher if the genes are far apart in other words genes will cross over together more often if they're actually far within the chromosome we the idea this idea was discovered by a different scientist called Stuart Vunt which is a disciple or a pupil of 
Thomas Hunt Morgan, and he actually used this to come up with a way of doing something that's called linkage mapping. Basically, what you do with linkage mapping is that you get the 1% recombination frequency and you equate to that to one map unit or centimorgan in, in homage to actual Thomas Hunt Morgan. Now, each map unit or 1% recombination frequency means the closestness of those two things. A gene that's 1% recombination frequency with another gene is basically never crossing over together and that's because it must be very close within the chromosome. A gene that is 40% apart from another gene probably crosses over together very often because they are far apart within the same chromosome. Now, if you know the combination frequencies between different pairs of, of genes, you can actually use that to create a map of the chromosome. For example, if you know that gene B and gene CN are 9% apart, and you know that gene CN and gene VG are another 9.5% apart, you can actually create a picture of the way the chromosome looks like. And if you want to know how to do this in a little more detail, watch the video where I go about this in a little more detail. The only problem, of course, is that if you get a recombination frequency of 50%, that's basically the same thing as of, of a gene that's independently assorting. In other words, that there's uh, no chance that these genes are going to be traveling together. And so, when you get the per uh, recombination frequencies of 50%, it's the same thing as if the gene was in a completely different chromosome. So the genes are so far apart from each other that there's actually the kind of like they're in different chromosomes. There's got to be a way to differentiate between a gene that's so far apart in the chromosome that they're getting a recombination frequency of 50% and the gene that's actually on different chromosomes. How do you do that? Look at a third gene and look at the relationship between them. If there is, for example, two genes, gene A and gene B are far apart by 20%, and then you have a gene C that's far apart from that gene by another 30%, well, if you look at the difference between A and C, that's going to be 50%. And that would be indistinguishable from two genes on separate chromosomes. But since you know the difference between A and B is 20, and the difference between B and C is 30, that means those genes are going to be in the same chromosome. It, genes A and C is just so far apart that it almost looks like they're in different chromosomes or independently assorting. That means that it's not necessarily true that the greater the genetic recombination frequency, the greater the chances of linkage. Sometimes when you get close to 50%, that actually means that the genes are going to be so far apart that they might as well be in different chromosomes, and at that point, there is no linkage between them. So you actually have to look at a third gene to see if they're in the same chromosome and therefore if it's going to be linkage. There are, of course, nowadays better ways to actually do mapping. You have cytogenic mapping where you actually tag the gene and then look at the microscope to see where it is in the chromosome. You have physical mapping where you arrange different fragments of DNA in ways that make logistical sense and you find out how genes actually uh, connect to each other. And there's also gene sequencing mapping, which is the ultimate way to get a genome map by looking at the actual sequence of bases in the DNA and seeing where the genes start and end. And so, but that means that uh, linkage mapping is actually the least accurate way of actually mapping the genome, followed by cytogenic mapping, followed by physical mapping, followed by gene sequencing mapping nowadays. But all this technology has only advanced our understanding of why what are chromosomes and what they do. But we have gotten to the point that we actually have mapped extensively many traits within the human genome and if we continue to do this and to do comparisons between the genes of one person and another person or even between different species to try to understand how genes actually work and how we actually determine, how traits are actually determined and how we inherit these traits across several generations.